Again, I would like to thank those of you that are tuning in, uh, those that have tuned in on uh, multiple occasions, have enjoyed uh, the messages. Uh, we are located in Wilton, New Hampshire, Good News Bible Church on 27 Hutchinson Road, and we meet at 10 a.m. on Sundays, and we would love to have you come visit. If you do not have a church home, uh, please come and visit us and be blessed. Thank you. It is an honor and privilege to be here. Uh, I've been here once or twice before filling in. Um, like Hannah, the connection being through the Vitellos to this church is very strong with Jaffrey and just the fellowship we share. It is a privilege and honor to be able to serve with you here today. Um, again, my name is Bill McGonigal, um, married 29 years, three grown kids, uh, long time ago graduated Moody Bible Institute, used to be a youth pastor, been in the help desk industry for 22 years now, uh, kind of a career change that life called, uh, God called me through. Um, but I'm, I'm eager and excited about God's word and specifically about the message he has for us this morning. Can we pray with me one time as we get started here? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, get me out of the way. I, I, I don't want me shining through. I want you shining through. I want your word coming forth. Lord, may you be pleased to enrich and change our lives because of it. Lord, when we walk out of this building this morning, may we be more motivated to be obedient to your word. May our faith be larger than it, what, what it was when we walked in. And Lord, may you have your way with us, not only here and now, this day, not this week, this month, but for our lives. We surrender and yield all of it to you. To you be the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> My daughter was kind of nervous when she walked up to me. I could tell the anxiety was sitting there on her. This was about 11 years ago. My oldest daughter, Sarah. <clears throat> How would you respond? What thoughts would go through your head when your children come up to you and go, hey, Dad, I got something I want to talk to you about. <laughs> what, what races through your mind? So I braced myself emotionally, you know, uh, intellectually, okay, what this might be about. She's 14 years old, and she says, I think God's calling me to go on a missions trip. I said, okay, you're 14, but okay, let's, let's listen. Tell me a bit more. Who is the mission ship with? What organization? Where are you going? And so forth. And what's their background? How long have they been doing missions trips? And she filled me in. She had very prepared, had a lot of information. I said, okay, okay. Where's the mission trip? She goes, Peru. Okay. So my 14 year old daughter wants to leave the country on her first mission trip. All right. That's good. My daughter was nervous because she was afraid she knew the answer she wanted. She knew the answer she believed God was calling her to, but she was afraid dad wouldn't see it. Dad wouldn't say yes. So I looked at my daughter lovingly and said, yes. She goes, what? I said, yes. I, you really? Yes. I wasn't expecting that. Apparently. I said, but who am I to get in your way if God's calling you to go on a missions trip. How can I get in the way of what God wants to do in your life? If he is calling you and you're certain of it, you have my blessing, go. So she sent in her application to be part of the missions trip. It got approved. We started helping her craft a fundraising letter, which got sent out to her friends, family, everybody she had a connection with. <clears throat> and if you've ever been on a missions trip, and you've had to write these fundraising letters. You know how this works, you, usually. The money trickles in, the deadline gets closer, the money trickles in, the deadline gets closer, and the money trickles in, and the deadline's getting closer. And this is exactly what my daughter experienced. And she came to me with a little worry. And she's got, Dad, how am I gonna go? All the money's not here yet. And I said, well, the deadline's not here yet either. She goes, yeah, I know, but it's not coming in. I said, Honey, do you still feel called? Do you feel God is calling you to go on this missions trip? And she said, yes. And I prayed a quick prayer. Lord, give me the words. Give me, whatever they are, give me the words that I need to tell my daughter right now. And before I can blink my eye, these words popped in my head. I said, honey, 
God's call is always followed by God's supply. Always. Always. So if he is calling you, he's going to supply the means for you to go. And, and sure enough, all the money came in on time. It was all submitted and off she went. And that was the first of three or four mission trips she went on to um, countries in South America, um, which had profound impact on her faith journey and had an impact of where she is today in her walk. It's just amazing to be the audience to see and watch my daughter grow through this. God's provision is amazing. And a couple of things, a couple of th <laughs> my life has been no more different than hers. Uh, a long time ago, before I was married, when I was a young man, um, I was attending a church in Amherst, New Hampshire. I was volunteering with the youth group um, and they were getting ready to go on a missions trip. <clears throat> the youth pastor there, Jamie, was going to take the teens to Chicago. It was called Sun Life Evangelistic Missions Project. And we would be in the classrooms in the morning learning apologetics, how to share your faith. And in the afternoons, we'd be walking the streets of Chicago, sharing our faith. And I want to learn how to better share my faith and, and do this. And I want to encourage and lead the youth and the teens through this. So I wanted to go. So I <laughs> journey very similar to Sarah's. I fundraiser, got my letter out, sent out friends, family, everybody I had connections with. And it was trickling in and the deadline was getting closer. And the, it was trickling in and the deadline was getting closer. And I'm like, man, I'm about $310 short. Lord, please help. Well, a couple of months prior to this, my grandmother passed away. And my grandmother was adamant near the end of her life that every family member would get something, would be blessed by her in the end. And her children and their spouses and her, all her grandchildren got something. And you know, I tell you, just before the deadline, a check came in the mail. And it was my inheritance for my grand. You're not going to believe how much the check was for. $310. God's call is always followed by God's supply. Always. A little further on in my life, our family was young. We had, our, our, we had one child, one on the way. We were living, I was serving as a youth pastor in uh, St. Cloud, Minnesota. And all we had was this little Ford Escort. I mean, little Ford Escort, and our family was getting bigger. Like, Lord, we need to do something. We need help. This car's not going to cut it. Our family's getting bigger, and we're not going to fit. I barely fit in the Ford Escort as I stand here before you. Um, so we prayed about it, and we went car shopping. And we went to the local dealership, one of the local dealerships, and there was one van after another van, and vans were all the rage at the time. <clears throat> And then there was a van in the back of the dealership. And it, you know, from my perspective, it had this halo aura around it. <laughs> you know, like, let's go look at that one. Um, and I, I knew what it was. I knew how much it was before we got there. I knew it was going to fit in the budget before we got there. I just had this sense of peace that that was it. God called us to serve in St. Cloud, Minnesota. And God's call was followed by God's supply. He provided for our family. Another story from before I was um, married. I worked at a manufacturing plant over in Merrimack, New Hampshire. A small company, family-run company called HF Staples. They're really famous for one product called Miracle Wood. If you really want to know, you can Google that and find Miracle Wood at your local True Value hardware store or something. But <clears throat> uh, the family, uh, one of the family members, it was a father and two older brothers that ran the company. One of the brothers I went to church with, he asked me to come work for him for a while. Um, I did a lot of fork lift driving at the time, you know, taking crates and stuff down off the racks and everything. And, and we had a cage we attached to the forklift and that we would clip into. And so we could do repair work up in the ceiling and change lights and what have you. And then we had this one room where we needed to extend our pneumatic airline through. So I had a guy, I was the forklift driver. So I had a, a guy up on the, in the cage installing pneumatic airline and we were just talking. We were having a conversation and, and just sharing life and and faith came up. He goes, Christianity, what's what's that about? I mean, what do you mean? What what do you believe in? I'm like, I'm so glad you asked, let me tell you. And I tell I kid you not, I didn't think of the words, the words just came out. 
I believe God called me in that moment to share the gospel with that man. And he called, God's call is followed by God's supply. I didn't have to think about what I was going to say. It just came. It was a good thing, too, because he wasn't coming down off that forklift until he heard the gospel. So he's kind of stuck. Anyway, it was one point in time in my life, my wife and I both got laid off at the same time. And don't you know, I'm like, the deacons of my church, Bill, do you need help? What, what can we do for you? I, I said, I'm not worried. I, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about our bills being paid. I'm not concerned about our ends being met. I'm concerned what God's going to grow me through as the process as I go through this, right? That's what it's about. Well, in the end, my dad, I said, my, my wife, a couple months later, got a job. Um, I got a part-time job at a technical tech company, which I am with still today, full-time, I'm a manager now. Um, but at the time I was just part-time and it wasn't our, we couldn't fill our budget. We couldn't be able to stay in our house. And I'm like, Lord help. So my dad said, what's the difference? What do you need? What's the difference in what you're making to what your budget is so you can stay in your house? And I told him, he says, okay, I'll, I'll make the difference up. So my dad and my mom provided for us for over a year making up that difference in our budget so we could stay in our home. We felt called to be in Jaffrey. We felt called to be at Jaffrey Bible Church. And God's call is always followed by God's supply. Always. God is good. God is amazing. I want to take you through at 30,000 feet from a couple Bible stories. Perhaps if you read or study the Bible on a regular basis, these will be f familiar to you. But I want to look at these in the context of God's call is followed by God's supply. And then we're going to get to our main uh, scripture passage for the morning, which will be uh, Matthew 6. So you want to open it, get ready. We'll get there in a moment. But if you're someone who likes to take notes, I think there's some blank on the back of your bulletin. Write down God's call is followed by God's supply. God's, you, you know, my prayer for you I'm going to say that so many times in this message. You're going to have that echoing in your head. It's going to be an earworm as you leave the church this morning. But my prayer is it echoes in your life, not just today, not this week, not this month, but for the rest of your life. So whenever you come across difficult circumstances, you say, Dear Lord, I have no idea how this is going to be met. The first thing that comes to your mind, God's call is followed by God's supply. God's call is always followed by God's supply. Period. Abraham. We all know the story of Abraham, but have you heard of the Abrahamic covenant? Something they teach you in Bible college, or if you read a, a commentary uh, about the life of Abraham, it may come up, the Abrahamic covenant. It's basically a way of summarizing God's promises to Abraham when he chose him to be a father of nations, or of a nation. The first part of that Abrahamic covenant is a blessing, that he would be a source of blessing for many nations. The second part is that he would be a great seed. He would himself would birth forth a great nation, Israel. And then finally, that nation would be given the land from the river of Egypt up to the Euphrates. God's call is always followed by God's supply. But part of that story is his wife, Sarah. He had to have children to start to, to start the nation. And his wife was of elder, and she, he provided by giving her the ability to conceive in older age to give birth to a son. But then what, he, what did God do then? He said, oh, by Abraham, you know that, that son of yours, the one of my promise? I want you to go take him into the wilderness and sacrifice him to me. Do you think Abraham's going, wow, well, well, yeah, I know. God's call is followed by God's supply. I feel good about this. So, but Abraham was obedient. He also knew that God could raise him from the dead if he so chose. So he takes his son off into the wilderness. And just before the knife comes down, God says, wait, wait. You passed the test. I know your faith is genuine, true, and real, and in me. And then in Genesis 22 Verse 13, then Abraham raised his eyes and looked and behold, behind him, a ram caught in the thicket 
by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up as a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. What is Jehovah Jireh? What a sweet name. If you ever have the chance to do a study on the names of God, I'd encourage you to do so. All of his names are sweet and rich because they echo and represent his character. God is a God who provides, period. And that's why you can say God's call is always followed by God's supply because it's his character. It's who he is. Joseph. We know the story of Joseph, coat of many colors, had a dream. His family would bow down to him. Brothers didn't like that very much, did they? Took him off, sold him into slavery. Ended up being a slave in Potiphar's house. His Potiphar's wife wanted a little hanky-panky. He, being the good boy, ran the other way. But she falsely accused him. He got thrown into prison. Do you think he's sitting there in prison going, boy, God's call is followed by God's supply. Well, this, is, this is amazing. Have you ever been in a dark place? Have you ever been in a, a dungeon where you wonder, God, where's your provision? What now? Well, you know the rest of the story. <coughs> the cupbearer finally remembers his name, mentions that uh, he can interpret dreams, goes before Pharaoh, interprets a dream, becomes the number two man in all of Egypt. Man, talk about your promotions, going from the bottom to the top. God's call is always followed by God's supply. God used him to prepare Egypt and the surrounding nations and people to prepare for a seven-year famine. And what happened? His brothers came before him, didn't recognize him at first. Eventually they did. And in Genesis 50, 8 through 21, or 18 to 21. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. God's call is always followed by God's supply. Noah, we know the story of Noah. God not only called him to build an ark, he gave him the blueprints. He told him the dimensions. He told him that he wanted many rooms. And then he provided the door for the, he provided the animals to walk in through the door. God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am bold. I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make it the ark with rooms shall cover it inside and out with pitch and he goes on with many different instructions of how to build it he god provided the blueprints he called them provide the blueprints provide the animals provide the food he provided the water and he certainly did that didn't he and afterwards he provide the land god's call is always followed by god's supply moses he called him to lead his people out of Egypt. God provided 10 plagues, favor with the Egyptians when they left to take all the loot. Remember that? It's like he, he granted favor in the eyes of the Egyptians, so they were giving away all their valuables to the Israelites. If you want to start a nation, what do you need? An economy. God's call is always followed by God's supply. He also, you know, favor the Egyptians in a path through the Red Sea talked about Sarah already, Nehemiah. Nehemiah, Israel was in bondage. They were in captivity, but there were a few remnants back living in Jerusalem. Nehemiah was serving the king and his heart wept when he heard a report about the condition of things back home. The walls are in ruin, the gates are torn down, and he was serving before the king. Kids, why the long face? And he told him. <clears throat> king said, okay. You have my permission. Go. Not only do you have my permission here, let me give you an order to cut down as many as trees as you need to take with you to rebuild the gate. 
God's call is always followed by God's supply. David, he called him to slay a giant. God provided five stones. He only needed one. Jacob conquered the promised land. Rahab, Ruth, Gideon, Daniel, 12 disciples. Jesus. God called Jesus to save the world. And he provided the means to do so. God's call is always followed by God's supply. But it's not only about physical things that get provided. Luke 12, verses 11 and 12. Jesus speaks, When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Just like my guy in the forklift. God's call is followed by God's supply. We just need to be bold. We need our faith to be bigger and to be bolder in our actions and lean into the fact that God's call will be followed by his supply. Now, there's some context to this, and this is where we're going to get to our main central passage today. A river has river banks. When you take children bowling, they put the bumpers in the bowling alley so the ball stays in on the lane, not falling into the gutter, right? This is the context I want to provide you about God's call is always followed by God's supply. So Matthew 6, 25 through 34. We're going to read all the way through it, but we're going to pay special attention to verse 33. Verse 25, For this, this, this is a verse about anxi anxiety, how to deal with anxiety. It's what most people talk about when they preach on this passage. But again, we're looking this in the context of God's provision. Okay. Verse 25, For this reason I say to you, do not wor be worried about your life. As to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you put on. Is not life more than food? And the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. There's no bird bank that the birds go to make withdrawals from. It's all one-offs. It's fast food, people. Wouldn't it be great to be a bird? You can live off fast food. That'd be amazing. Not gain any weight. Oh, love it. Are you not worth much more than they? And you... Uh, excuse me, and who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon, in all his glory, clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith. Do not, be, do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, what we will drink, what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough a trouble of its own. <coughs> Excuse me. If you like to mark up, highlight your Bibles, can you go back to verse 33 and highlight, circle, underline, whatever you want, the word first. Seek first. First, not second. First. What are you seeking? His kingdom and his righteousness. Two things. Not one, not just his kingdom. His righteousness as well. And all these things will be added. Highlight, circle, underline, added. You know what the Greek word there means for added? Provided. Well, wouldn't that be pertinent to the topic we're talking about today? How God provides. When we seek first, then they are added. That is the context of God's call is always followed 
by God's supply. If it's his call, it's about his kingdom. If it's about his kingdom, it's about his righteousness. And if we follow that, then we get his supply. God's call is always followed by God's supply. I was, it's about first things first. First things first. I was reading a commentary on this uh, Matthew 6 passage, and it had this to say. When people make God's kingdom and his righteousness their primary objective or primary object of their desire, they find the ability to trust him to meet their needs. The book of Haggai, I know you've been in, in Haggai recently in your quiet time, it's, it's a page turner, right? Large book, small prophet. But the theme of Haggai, the main idea is it's a story of God's people who are so focused on their satisfaction. That's not our problem today in our culture, right? About our satisfaction. Yeah, what, what we, well, I'm in the mood to watch right now. I don't want to watch that. I feel like watching that. It's about our satisfaction. So this is a book about God's people who are so focused on their own satisfaction. They failed to flourish because of it. Their repentance and obedience would result in God's blessing, right? So Haggai 1.9, write that down, Haggai 1.9, that's a good reference. It says, you look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why? <clears throat> Declares the Lord of hosts. And he answers, because of my house, which lies desolate, while each of you runs to his own house. God's call is followed by God's supply in the context of first things first. C.S. Lewis has a great, he actually has a lot of great quotes. Aslan, my all-time favorite fictional character. This is not him, but I just had to mention that because it's C.S. Lewis. Um, his quote, put first things first and second things are thrown in. Put second things first and you lose both first and second things. Sean McDowell. If you're familiar with Josh McDowell, famous apologetics Started out in college, sharing the gospel, had a wonderful ministry. He's 80 something years old now and he's still going. But his son kind of followed in his footsteps. He's a Bible professor for apologetics out in California. And he was going to this conference to speak on apologetics with his dad. And the pastor who was overseeing this conference invited a former youth pastor. And this former youth pastor left the faith. He just gave up on God. So I'm done. So the pastor invited this youth pastor. The youth pastor said, yeah, sure, I'll come. All right. And he told Sean this. Sean, we got this youth pastor. He gave up in his faith, but he's coming. Sean's like, well, can I have lunch with him? Would he be willing to have sit down and have lunch with me? And the pastor went back and asked the youth pastor and he said, yeah, I'll, I'll meet with him. That's fine. Not a problem. And Sean's here. I, you know, I... I just want to hear your story. I'm not here to browbeat you or anything. I just want to hear your story. What happened? And as the conversation went along, he was kind of feeling helpless as an apologist at the time. By the way, Sean is getting ready to write a book about this phenomenon of why people are leaving the church. I'm kind of eager for that to come out and read it myself. But towards the end of the conversation, Sean asked this former youth pastor this question. Tell me about the moment you knew you were a sinner and you cried out for God's grace. And he answered. The former youth pastor said, I, I didn't become a Christian because I was a sinner and needed forgiveness. I became a Christian because I was hurting and was told that Jesus would make me feel better. That there is a prime example of putting second things First, that is a false gospel, people. The gospel is that we are sinners and we need to be saved through faith 
in Christ Jesus alone. Now, as a result of that, we might life might start coming together and feeling better and falling into place. But you and I, if we've been in the faith long enough, you also know there's seasons of life where things don't go so good because of that as well. And when you put second things first, you lose both first and second things. I'm going to close with three, three thoughts. Three thoughts. I'm going to close with this. Providence. God's providing to us. His providence does not absolve us. He doesn't dissolve any person of responsibility. We cannot sin and expect God to clean up for us. There's this famous joke I love, and I've told it several, and maybe you've heard it from somebody else, about this man who's so sad with his life, he commits suicide. He jumps off a tall skyscraper. And as soon as his foot leaves the the building, he changes his mind, and he cries out, God, forgive me. And he hears the voice. He says, I forgive you. By the way, I'll see you in just a second. <laughs> there's forgiveness, but there's not always absolution of the consequences. Is there? God's providence absolves no person of responsibility. We cannot sin and expect God to clean up after us. Two, Providence is not fatalism. Providence is not fatalism. If you're an older generation like me, you may have heard the phrase, whatever will be, will be. Eh, whatever will be, will be. It's fatalistic. It's, gonna, it's the way fate planned it out. What's the common phrase today? It is what it is. I so hate that so much. It is. If you uh, Suggestion? Suggestion, don't use that phrase around me. <laughs> just, just, you'll get me on my soapbox. It is what it is. God, the province is not fatalism. God is intimately involved in caring for his creation in order to accomplish his purposes. It's, it is what it is or whatever will be will be is not synonymous with providence. They're antithesis of each other. They're the opposite. As God's children, we should know that more than anyone else in this world. Thirdly, providence is centered in Christ, not in us. Providence, God's provision is centered in Christ, not in us. Romans 8, 28 is a great comfort. God will work all things together for good for those who love him, right? It's a great comfort, and Paul does say that God's activity is for the good of those who love him. Something larger than individuals is happening with the scope of providence. All of God's providence is directed toward the goal of establishing his son over all things. Go read Psalm chapter 2. Thus, that which is for our good is ultimately for the good of God's kingdom, of which we are a part. We must not allow God's providence to become self-centered. It is for our good, which is directed toward his glory. And this is the mystery of providence, how God can direct his activities for good for everyone who loves him, while at the same time exercising his providence at a corporate level for all of creation. God's call is followed by God's supply in the context of first things first. Put first things first and second things are thrown in. Put second things first and you lose both first and second things. C.S. Lewis. Jehovah Jireh, sweet is the name of the Lord. I hope today, my prayer for you today is God's call is followed by God's supply echoes through your soul, your heart, and your mind for the remainder of your walk with him on this side of heaven. That your faith grows bigger as a result. Because sometimes God's more concerned about our character than our comfort, and things get rough. 
And we need to lean into his truth at those times more than ever before. And knowing that God's call is followed by God's supply can be a great comfort at the right time. Amen? You pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, your word's amazing. I, and I'll say it again. Your names are so, so sweet because they reflect you. Thank you for being the God of character that you are. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, your holiness, your righteousness, your anger towards injustice, your love for your people. And Lord, thank you so much. Specifically today, we want to say thank you for Jehovah Jireh, the name that says you will provide. Your call is followed by your supply. Lord, we stand at your mercy. We thank you so much for undeserved gifts. And Lord, as I said before, help all of our faith be bigger today than it, than it was yesterday and bigger tomorrow than it is today. Help us to lean in knowing you are trustworthy and true and you will provide. In Jesus' name, amen.